Early in the program, experts sit down and analyze the Gemini 8 flight. They know it is a three-day mission. Its primary purposes include rendezvous in space with an Agena target vehicle, the first docking in space, and a two-hour spacewalk by pilot David Scott. The experts then devise problems that could occur, some simple, some quite challenging. They feed these problems into a computer and sit back and see what happens, perhaps with a little glee. At any rate, the crew in the simulator and the controller at the console are given the problem. Both must respond correctly. About 90 problems will be run for the Gemini 8 mission. On the schedule are two days devoted to the Agena target vehicle. Four days devoted to network simulations and two days scheduled for running re-entry simulations, including emergency re-entries. Eleven days of problem solving. Most probably none of them would turn up during the flight. But if one should, the crew and the 5,000 people in the ground network that support these two men would be ready. The crew is entering their spacecraft for what has every sign of being a normal flight. At the same time, on Launch Complex 14, the Atlas Agena count is only 25 minutes from liftoff. The Gemini mission is largely based on a successful orbit of the target vehicle. The Agena count has no holds. Right on the nose at 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, the Atlas launch vehicle ignites. Atlas has three main propulsion engines which ignite at liftoff. Two are booster engines and one is a sustainer engine. The booster engines cut off first, some two minutes, 40 seconds into the flight. The sustainer engine then takes over and propels the Agena to an altitude of 654,190 feet. Two small vernier engines on the Atlas continue to position the Agena properly in the later phases of launch. They cut off at five minutes, six seconds after liftoff. The Agena propulsion system then inserts the target vehicle into a circular orbit. Today, the flight plan calls for a circular orbit of 161 nautical miles. Something close to that would be acceptable. The Agena propulsion system can be started from the ground and a burn completed to change the orbit. But as the final figures come up to the flight dynamics officer, no in-flight burns will be needed. Agena has hit the planned circular orbit of 161 nautical miles. This is a good beginning for any rendezvous flight. The news is given the crew by the spacecraft communicator. Pilot Scott comes back with just what the doctor ordered. The flight director now calls for launch of Gemini 8 at 11.40 and 59 seconds Eastern Standard Time. Page 2 pre is coming open, 5 seconds. came as Flight Director Hodge had requested, 11.40 and 59 seconds. With two good orbits, target vehicle and spacecraft, Gemini 8 had a head start on rendezvous and docking. The maneuvers for rendezvous would be essentially the same as those performed by Gemini 6. So fast does the space program accelerate that rendezvous was the primary objective of Gemini 6 in December. But three months later, it is March and rendezvous almost seems routine.
Everyone is focused more on docking. Everyone except those who fly the mission. Then you take things step by step. This is Gemini Control Houston. About two minutes ago, Neil Armstrong called in over to Nana Reeve, and he was able to confirm at that time that radar lock had been established. Roger, do you have solid radar lock on with the Agena? Over. Roger, thank you. Sounds good. Uh, we're indicating 158 miles range and elevation of about 4 degrees. After radar lock-on, the crew will circularize their orbit inside that of the target vehicle. Okay, we've got a visual on the Agena at 76 miles. Roger, understand. Visual, Agena, 76 miles. Hello, uh, Houston. This is Gemini 8. Uh, we're stationed keeping on the Agena at about 150 feet. Way to go, partner. You've done it, boy. You've done a good job. Do the thing. Boy, look at that sucker. That's beautiful. See the dipole? Do I ever. I see everything with that color. Man, that's great. Man, that is really slick. A bit of all right. Okay, the first thing we really have to do, platform parallelism, 650 to 710, and they're giving us the SPC loaded jaw maneuver. It looks like that nominal time. So they're going to give you that time. I'll check your little status display for you. I bet those Lockheed guys are just jumping up and down. The S10 is on. Yeah. Okay. We are looking at the left, or command pilot's window, as the station-keeping exercise with Agena begins. Gemini 8 had no difficulty in maneuvering in the vicinity of the Agena. The onboard film, as in past flights, was at six frames per second and is being projected at four times that speed. Okay, Gemini 8, uh, we have TM solid. You're looking good on the ground. Go ahead and... Uh Okay, go ahead with your memory compare. Roger. Let us know what you get out of that. We're flight, we are down. That was it. Two vehicles docked for the first time in space. It was about this time that Jim Lovell almost qualified as the space prophet of the year. For seven hours after liftoff and 27 minutes of normal docking, an excessive yaw and roll motion occurred. The crew punched up 400, but the trouble was not in the Agena. Unable to find an immediate answer, Mr. Armstrong undocked. The roll rate continued to build up, reaching about one revolution per second. Struggling to regain control, Mr. Armstrong was forced to fire the re-entry thrusters and gradually reasserted control over the spacecraft. Neither crewman experienced any loss of orientation. Gemini never approached a critical structural strain. Once the re-entry thrusters are fired, there is the possibility of fuel leakage in orbit, leaking of fuel essential for re-entry. The flight had been highly successful through 27 minutes of docking but final action rests squarely on the shoulders of this man, the flight director. A decision came quickly. Fuel readings were too low. Abort. 